Lots of people make the mistake of thinking a business that makes a million a year is going to be one of those enormous traffic graphs you see maybe on Twitter, maybe on LinkedIn. But generally, in my experience, the opposite tends to be true. And a lot of those really nice traffic spikes tend to be just large amounts of info content that doesn't really have much transactional value. Whereas some of the most profitable websites I've seen have actually been comparatively very small. And while I agree that having supporting content to establish topical authority is important, today's case study would probably convince you that this idea of having hundreds of articles of info content is not going to do much to increase your bottom line. Whereas this website, although it's only got a domain rating of 32 and only gets 14,000 visitors per month, whom only 8,000 are actually in the relevant location of the UK, this site is still making a million a year. Now in today's video, I want to take you right back to when this website was really struggling. And then by the end of this video, I want you to understand absolutely everything we did to turn this into a million pounds a year site. That's a million pounds, so around $1.3 million. That's recurring revenue every year. And this is all through organic. If I scroll over here, you can see there's absolutely no keywords ranking in paid search. They're not using affiliate. They're not using Facebook ads. In fact, I've often pushed back and said they might want to diversify that traffic a bit with some paid ads. But the work we've done for them over the past couple of years has convinced them SEO is the only channel that works for them. Now, today's video is a bit of a long and complicated one. So I've basically taken the full step-by-step -step process we followed and put it all into a simple Google Doc. So if you click the link below, then I will give you that Google Doc absolutely free. On the other hand, if you don't want to worry about how to achieve these results yourself, you just want us to get them for you using our tried and tested process, then I'll also leave a link below to seojesus.com slash apply, where you can learn more about how our service works. We're very heavily productized, so we only give you the deliverables that actually make results. It's not like those agencies that charge $2,000 a month and then disappear and don't really do anything apart from working on a few keywords. But instead, we'll complete your full topical map for you, which includes content writing, interlinking, and link building. Of course, you're probably not worried about how we actually achieve that. You just want to know about the results. So we've got various screenshots here from Search Console, showing numerous clients that have seen fantastic results with our process. So I'd be lying if I said it worked absolutely 100% of the time, but generally we do have a very good success rate. And in today's case study, I'm going to show you how this site got a 10x ROI of its SEO spend. So every year it now makes 10 times its total investment in SEO. And that's before we get into the resale value of that site once it's sold. It's got a few testimonials down here. It's FAQs about the service and the application form. So we do want to make sure you're a good fit. If we don't think you're a good fit, then hopefully we can point you in the right direction for free. It might just be that SEO is not the right strategy for you. But because of the results we tend to get, our service is very popular. Clients do tend to stick around. So I encourage you to fill in this application form before we have to close it and then reserve your place in that queue. So this brand actually launched in 2016, so way back. And by the time I worked with them in 2019, they were facing a number of issues. So they had invested £30,000 in a very heavily custom-built content management system, basically their website. Now, this was having all sorts of performance issues with speed. It meant the paid ads they were running weren't converting wealth, getting very low quality scores because the page load time was so low. And if we did want to make any edits or changes, then that would have to be a full refer for change document that was then sent to an IT team. And it would therefore be very expensive every time they simply wanted to update something. So when late in 2019, I was convincing them to start publishing relevant content around certain keywords, the best we could do was they had a blog section attached to the website. This used to be very common and arguably I'd say it's probably too common to date where it's very common to have all your sales pages and then simply bolt on a blog section. So slash blog slash blog post. And then in your footer somewhere, you would then have that blog link. Now the trouble with that is you're clustering all your content in a separate section of the website. So your sales pages aren't really hooked up to your blog posts, so they're not really getting the full value of that supporting content. That content is also not being clustered very effectively because they're all in just a general blog category. So you can create virtual silos with internal links where blog posts in the same category can link to each other and signify topical authority that way. But generally speaking, especially on a big website, it's much easier to have separate subfolders for each category. And meanwhile, by burying these articles in the blog section, it was therefore several clicks away from the homepage, which meant a lot less link equity from the homepage was getting through to those blog posts. And also in terms of cruel depth and cruel budget, Google just simply wasn't reaching those blog posts effectively. It was coming to the website, then having to go through the, to the blog and then having to go through the blog role or the categories in order to eventually get to a blog post content. And then just in terms of CRO, 
if any of these blog posts actually did rank, then it's very difficult to actually create a conversion friendly layout when you're working within this existing blog template. So it was actually during the pandemic in early 2020, where we took the plunge and we started rebuilding the whole website on WordPress. Now, of course, for this brand, this was a big trust exercise. It took a lot of time and persuasion for us to ultimately sell them on the idea. But the point was the existing build was slow, clunky and expensive. And eventually it took me pitching them. This was way back in my early days. I said, I'm going to spend a week and just blast through it and clone your entire website on Elementor, on WordPress, on a UAT staging website. So I worked extremely hard that week. Let's face it, in the pandemic, there wasn't much else for me to do. But the result was they could see the value in what I'd done. I'd made it seem easy. If you're a service provider struggling to get someone over the line, then really, if you see it as easy, then demonstrate to them how easy it can be to try and reduce that risk for them. Now, while we were going about cloning the website, it made sense to also revamp the whole site structure. So that's where we basically did our full keyword research and keyword mapping and tried to identify what were the key clusters that we really wanted to focus on. So we'd basically take each niche insurance product they wanted to sell. And then from that, we would try and come up with 50 blog post titles, 50 keywords, and then write a blog post for each one. Now, in order to organize this all together, we had to map each of these blog posts to basically a category. And generally that category would be the insurance product they actually wanted to sell. Once we decided on those categories, we would use that in the URL structure. So it would have, for instance, slash auto insurance slash. So that would be brandname.com slash auto insurance slash the keyword or the blog post. So is auto insurance a legal requirement? Something like that. Now, at this point, arguably there's some con confusion because if you made your category page is also the same as your sales page for that product, then you're kind of trying to do three things at once. You want a product page. There's also a category page. So this auto insurance page, for example, needs to both sell and rank for auto insurance, but it also needs to hold the full archive of auto insurance posts in that category. But the answer is quite simple. So if we have a sales page like this, now we have our header at the top. And in the header, we have each niche of insurance that we want to sell. Now, if you have a lot of products like this, and of course you can use a mega menu that then drops down and it's got all the subcast of each product you want to sell. But then fundamentally you have your sales page like that. So you're going to have your big buy now button, which is the most important part that most people actually forget about. So let's keep this page going. You've got all your features and benefits. Maybe that's a two column layout. So features there, features here. Here you might have your testimonials, for instance. So hopefully you get the idea. This is just a rough draft of what the sales page looks like. But then right at the bottom, we'd have a new section that would be more information about niche, whatever your keyword is. So because when you're constructing the sales page, you need to make sure that this sales page is actually going to rank. And therefore you actually want rich content on this page as well. So actually we should probably move I lost that further down. I'll have a new section here. And then this is just all your long form content. Now in another recent video, I'll see if I can link to it below. I talked about how you can make your home pages and sales pages SEO optimized, but still user friendly. So what you do about your long term text, can you use accordions? And if you do use accordions, how to use them correctly? Otherwise, how can you lay out the content in a way that's more attractive to the user? But fundamentally, then at the bottom of the page, you have blog post blog post, blog posts. I normally go for about six to nine here. Now, typically if you're using a theme like Elemental, there'll be a more posts button here. You can enable infinite scroll and things like that. It all depends on individual circumstances, but basically you'll have tailored this carousel to only show posts from within that category. And therefore every one of these blog posts is going to be niche relevant to the core topic of the sales page. So this is a page about auto insurance. Then down here, we have all these questions and answers about auto insurance. And crucially, that means that as you're building all these links into the sales page to get it to rank, then some of that power is also then going to go through and down into these inner pages on the site because they are internally linked on this sales page. And let's not forget that this sales page is up here in the header. It's also going to be down here in the footer like this, which therefore means if you're on the home page. You only need to click once in the header to get to the sales page. And then every blog post is only one click away from the sales page. So if you do have either an infinite scroll or just a load more tab here, that fundamentally means that every blog post is not that far away from the homepage and it's on a relevant 
place on the site. It's within relevant content. And let's not forget, let me change color here. All these blog posts themselves are going to internally link together as well because they're clustered. And I want to keep that cluster closely internally linked together. So in the site overhaul, we did a number of things. We we're basically taking a slow site with no site architecture and very little content and turning it into a fast site with great architecture and really good speed. Putting on WordPress and optimizing all the images already has some great speed benefits, but we then went a step further and then used Niger Pack. So I'll leave a link below. They build a simple tool where you can put in your website and work out what kind of speed saving you can get by using their tool. It's very easy to start because they've actually got a free plan for when you're just starting out. So already a lot of work done, but then we started adding content because now the site was far easier to add content to, but also we've got that site architecture in place using subfolders so that within each category, we could just fill that category with relevant content, addressing all the potential questions and answers around that niche. So we can see this if I filter down to organic pages, we see a reduction in organic pages with the overhaul because we cleared out a lot of the junk and then a big increase as we started adding in fresh content. So now if I add in organic traffic, you can see that followed a short time later. So that classic SEO lag time. So started adding the content in April, 2020. And then it was around September, a few months later, that that really started to kick in. So as usual, we can see there was some initial traction when the lower competition stuff started ranking, but it was a few months to really get the serious traffic. And then as we see, as is very common with SEO, that continues to compound over time until eventually we surged up to around 20,000 visitors per month. But the next issue here, while site architecture and topical authority is great, we really cared about ranking for just a few key terms, which had high transactional value. They were at the bottom of the funnel. So it was the kinds of searches that people who were already looking to buy that product were making. But the downside of that, of course, is those terms do tend to be more competitive. So if I just take a random example of motor trade insurance, this is in the UK, we can see Go compare at number one, getting around 9,000 visitors per month with a DR of 76. And then we have a slightly lower DR site, 31, getting 3,000 visitors per month. And then a 51, getting 6,000 visitors per month. And so you get the idea. And then there's a little DR24 down here, getting 2,000 visitors per month. And even the 17th as well. So obviously this is very common. Bottom of page one, lots of lower DR sites. But then to really compete higher up, you don't have to have a massive DR72. But to get into the top three, ideally around the 30 to 50 mark. So that's based on backlinks. I also place a lot of emphasis on page level backlinks. So having the domain rating up in the 30s and 50s is one thing. But then if we come over here, we can also see these top ranking pages have got a high URL rating based on a large number of referring domains pointing at that exact page. So we often say that Google ranks pages rather than websites. And that's basically how the page rank algorithm works. It's about the backlink power of the individual page. We come down here, we can see NFU Mutual that's got a DR of 72. So in theory, biggest domain rating should therefore be at number one, but they've got barely any page level authority, a URL rating of just one based on just three referring domains. Now, generally lots of studies have shown a better correlation of ranking based on the URL rating rather than just domain rating. So both are of course important. And if you've got a higher domain rating, then your URL rating will still benefit from that. But even though I fully support building lots of links to your homepage, especially building up the brand to look natural, at the same time, you don't want to overlook building page level backlinks to the actual page you want to rank. They should be a minority of the overall website. You want to make sure the homepage is getting plenty of links. And then all your key transactional pages also get a fair spread of links. But you don't want your website to be top heavy where the home page has got everything and then the inner commercial pages don't have anything. And this is why I think it's important to have a varied backlink strategy. Because if you're doing something like digital PR, then obviously that's great. But it's very likely you're going to get a lot of branded no follow links to the home page. Whereas really we want to prioritize some powerful do follow links to the inner page that actually use keyword rich anchor text. So basically referencing the name of the product or the search term you're targeting in the text of the link. So if I just grab one of these top three pages at random, so we open that up and look at the backlinks to that exact page, then we can see exactly that. So motor trade insurance quote, got motor trade insurance. This actually seems to have used quite a lot of comment and forum spam using the same anchor text over and over again, but we saw it was in the top three. So even though we don't encourage a lot of these 
older practices, they do often still work in a lot of cases. Let's now use the best links filter to try and filter down how many of these 449 backlinks are actually good quality. Supposedly for that one, it's zero. Let's have a look at this other one instead. And it looks like they've been doing the same thing. They've got WordPress pingbacks enabled. That's quite an old strategy. We filter this down to best links. Then we can see two links there with brand name anchor text. So I'll try not to confuse you and overcomplicate that there. But as you can see, clear correlation, you need a volume of links. Ideally, you want to go for quality, but ultimately this is about velocity and volume. Even those lower DR sites that we saw ranking tended to have a lot of page level backlinks, even if they weren't the best backlinks in the world. Lots of studies out there claim that simply the number of referring domains, never mind the actual quality metrics of the links is actually a major ranking factor. So with this particular case study, we had some money pages. Obviously the first pages we wrote were money pages, transactional keywords, and they ranked pretty quickly. And then a lot of this graph later on was much more based on a lot of the info content we were putting in just for topical authority. But in the meantime, it was these keywords we did at the beginning that were actually making us money. Trouble is, a lot of them were stuck around position three, four, five, whereas position one generally gets double the traffic position two, which gets double the traffic of position three. So for that reason, and of course for the maintenance argument, because just because you're there now doesn't mean your competition isn't going to catch up with you. If you manage to snag a really good spot in the top three, then if you're in a good niche, be prepared for the fact that a lot of your competitors are probably going to be spending five to 10 grand a month to try and overtake you. So even if you are currently winning, there's a good logic there to actually maintaining your authority, keeping on building those links to keep you ahead of the competition. And so it's for that reason that after the content was completed, at least the transactional content, we kept on publishing info content in the background, but there's only so many transactional keywords out there we can go after, and we want to make sure we're really high up for each of them. So it's for that reason, we started a link building campaign. So if I add in the referring domains filter here, you can see that after years of stagnation, not really acquiring that many more links to then really quite aggressively building more links. In this case, it was only 10 backlinks per month, but that was enough to both safeguard existing positions and to claim new positions to then grow this brand to where it's now making a million pounds a year. So as I've explained in a previous video on this case study, total investment in this case was around $150,000. That's for our 10 backlinks a month plan, $3,000 per month, which includes keyword research, consulting, technicals, and also content writing with Surfer. And thus $150,000 investment now brings in a million pounds a year. What's more, this particular company is very much building to sell. And that's where the advantages of SEO really come in because any acquisition is coming from a real estate perspective where they've built this digital real estate, but there's no ongoing spend necessarily in order to keep that going. If this brand were 100% reliant on paid ads, then that ad cost would have a severe impact on the overall valuation. Whereas in this case, the SEO spend is much more of a long-term gain. They've sealed that position. So while I'd always advocate some budget for maintenance, just to keep ahead, that's going to be a much bigger profit margin than if they're entirely reliant on ads. Of course, don't rely on SEO 100%. You should be doing ads and all these other sources as well. And that makes an acquisition even more valuable. But in this case, fix the website, did the right keyword targeting, right site, site architecture, completed the topical map, then built high quality backlinks to the sales pages, total spend $150,000, and just a few years later, making a million pounds a year. And again, to compare like with like, so that's $150,000 spend, that's $1.3 million per year in return. And in terms of valuations, obviously it varies depending on industries and a lot of other factors, but the formal valuation they've received just as a ballpark is around 5 million. So in this case, just on annual earnings alone, this site makes 10 times its SEO investment back every single year.